All right, guys, it's time for another show. Let's get some pre-cals going. What do we have? What's going on today? Hey, I think I know what's going on. You do know what's going on. I think it's all you, buddy. It's it all is. me. It's all you. Hey, it's never yep. all me. It's it's never all me. But I will say that uh, I uh, we have a sleep scientist on the on the show today. Another sleep scientist. Let me put it that way. We've got a PhD, and it's 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 so cool. Um, what's even cooler is he is going to be talking about sleep and AI. What do you think about that? You know, it's it's one of those things that's going to continue to be a part of our show is how does AI fit into what we're doing? And I, and I hope what we get to hear in the next uh, few minutes is how he's looking at it differently. I have a feeling we're going to, you know, we're going to see a different view than we've seen before. And I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, I, all I want to know is how to get on a TED Talk. Like, <laughs> I think that would be an amazing experience. Um and I always go into the TED Talks thinking, you know, that it's going to be um, uh, this hour long present, but they're little short vignettes for the most part. And, uh, you know, with some pretty impactful uh, messaging. So I guess, number one, I got to figure out how to get get myself onto a TED Talk. And, and then secondly, what I would actually talk about. I, I would say I was really impacted by your word vignette. Vignette, Yes. <laughs> And those it's are the big word. It's a southern, it's a southern, southern term, Jerry. Hey, southern. I just had a conversation with a friend uh, today about southern things like sweet tea. How up north, if you ask for sweet tea, they look at you like you have three eyeballs, and it's it, I'm yeah. like, come on, man, sweet tea. No such thing. And, and and a lot of times it might even be hot. It, cold. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, and those are, it's not those, tea. It's not <laughs> those of you who are out, uh, watching us on YouTube. I got to tell you that uh, Emerson has got this whole Star Wars thing going on right now. So if yeah. you're on, on the podcast listening, I'd encourage you to just check it out on YouTube as well. It's magical. <laughs> it's it's it a is. magical thing. It is. I'm, I'm sort of here and not here. Yeah. Hey, hey, we got sweet tea. We've got southern vignettes. We got magic. And now we're on to AI. You guys ready? Yep. Let's do it. All right, on to the show. Now a word from our sponsor, MedBridge Healthcare. MedBridge Healthcare is a leading provider of sleep lab management services and home sleep apnea testing. MedBridge partners with hospitals, healthcare systems, and medical academic institutions to offer comprehensive, fully integrated services for sleep disorders. Welcome, everyone, once again to another episode of Sleep Tech Talk, the sleep podcast with your hosts and friends, Emerson Kerr, Robert Miller, and me, Dr. Gerald George Money Carot. Hey, folks, once again, we have another great episode for you. But before we get started, first off, a huge thanks to our sponsors. Be sure to check them out, and we, we can't thank them enough. Without them, we can't do this. And you know somebody else that we cannot do this without is you. We thank you so much for all the likes for all the shares and for all the subscriptions. At the end of the day, please don't forget to share it with all your other sleep tech friends because that's what this is all about. With that being said, we have a fantastic guest today, a sleep scientist. I know we had one before, but here's another opportunity to learn and get a little bit smarter with a sleep scientist, Dr. Daniel. And He's done quite a few things here. He's even done a TED Talk, which is absolutely exciting and was exciting for me to listen to that. But to tell us a little bit more about himself, Doc, welcome to the show. Great to be here. It's an absolute pleasure. Hey, thank you so much. And uh, hey, it's a pleasure for us to have you on. So typically we start off with how did you get into sleep? Could you tell us a little bit about that, please? Sure. It's sort of a complicated web of things that came together. I think I probably had delayed sleep phase syndrome as a teenager. I would go out late on the weekend socializing with my friends. And I remember um, 
falling asleep at my bus stop when I was still pitch dark out at 6 a.m. in the morning. And basically this disrupted my circadian rhythms and I had a really hard time falling asleep, especially on Monday night. So that was always in the back of my head. And this is something um, Wendy Trexel gives a great TED talk about this. Um, you know, it affects a large percentage of teenagers, um, you know, in the, you know, 10 to 20 percent. So um, there's a lot of solutions for it um, that we can get into, but that's sort of not my main focus. I guess then I went to undergrad and um, I started to take neuroscience of sleep courses. And I realized that if you could improve this process that we do one third of our time or we spend one third of our times doing, it would be game changing for our minds and you know our longevity. Um, so I'm, I'm just obsessed with this idea. If you could improve sleep, maybe 1% each night, how that would have a huge impact on public health and well-being. I ended up making one of the first sleep apps back in 20, 2009, and then I got a PhD in cognitive psychology, um, making artificial intelligence models of alertness for the Air Force and Naval Research Labs, um, basically trying to predict when a radio operator or um, pilot would get tired before they uh, fell asleep. Um, and then I got a series of grants from the NIH uh, developing various technologies, and that's where I'm at. That is super cool. And I will say the 1% thing, uh, Emerson, could you, you'd love to talk about that, don't you? The 1% piece. Well, you know, it's, it's kind of a very James Clear kind of thing of, you know, you can improve 1% every day. Where will you be? And, you know, you think about that from that standpoint, Doc, you know, when you're, when you're looking at what, you know, someone can improve in their sleep, what are the areas that you as a researcher, you want to focus on? Because, you know, when we think about that, we, you know, we think about the quality of sleep, we can think about the different stages of sleep, those sort of things. When you're thinking about that 1%, what does that mean to you and and what could it mean for our listeners? Yeah, yeah. I think it's uh, very specific. Um, I think of it like almost like a pyramid where you have different characteristics on the axes. Um, you know, first and foremost, People want to improve their deep sleep, but first and foremost, you should be getting enough sleep and addressing any sleep disorders that might exist. So I have like a stepped process how, of how I think about it. Um, step one, rule out any underlying sleep disorders. You know, that's going to give you the bang for your buck. Step two, make sure you're simply sleeping enough. Um, you know, sleeping enough has been associated with the most health outcomes. Um, you know, it's actually hard to find the effects of improving sleep quality, but amount, you know, is really tied to cardiovascular health, cognitive health, and all this stuff. And then finally, once we determine that there's no underlying disorder, um, that they're sleeping enough, um, and then insomnia is a whole nother bag of this because you actually reduce the amount of time you sleep usually when you treat insomnia. So that's a whole different story if you're in the insomnia bucket. Um, and then once you address all of those buckets, then we can focus on getting more deep sleep, improving the sleep quality. But I know that you developed an app for sleep. Is that still part of your, your ongoing research today? And are you still in development of that app? I know, and I know you've done work with the military, NIH, uh, so you, you've got uh, lots of irons in, in different fires. Yeah, I mean, it's all about sleep space right now. And um, so I, I stopped doing my full-time job in 2017 and focused on making this platform. It's, you know, come under many incarnations at this point. We just completed a randomized controlled trial um, with the NIH that honestly almost bankrupted me, but we got through it because um, uh, of COVID, it was very difficult to complete. But uh, we, we were basically trying to augment a therapist. So the recommended treatment for insomnia um, isn't a drug, isn't um, you know some supplement, 
it's it's changing your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors around sleep. Um, that has the more long lasting impact compared to, you know, pharmacological interventions, and it has less risks as well. Um, and so this is called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. The problem is that there's literally one person trained in this per like 10,000 people with insomnia. I think in the state of Alabama, there might be zero people trained in this or, or one or something like this. Um, so there's a huge access issue with the recommended treatment for the most pervasive sleep disorder that exists. Um, and so that's what NI, why NIH cares about this. Um, it's particularly relevant for people who want to optimize their brain function because poor sleep quality is tied to Alzheimer's disease. And that's how I, that's um, the story that I tell when, when I apply for these grants that we treat your insomnia and it reduces your risk of Alzheimer's disease. And um, so long story short, we're trying to, um, the first study, we're trying to augment that cognitive behavioral therapist. And you could also augment a coach too. Um, our system kind of works with both. And so we ran uh, this randomized controlled trial where we either compared cognitive behavioral therapy as usual, which is um, six weeks typically. Um, you can do it in person, but it's basically almost as effective via telehealth. Um, so six um, usually 30 to 50 minute telehealth consults, um, with a live human being. Um, so comparing that treatment over six weeks to sleep space, plus that treatment to a sleep hygiene control where the therapist is basically like, you should, you know, not drink coffee close to bedtime and like giving you general health things. Um, and so that's typically what's done for these randomized controlled trial. That's how, um, you know, one of the competitors or collaborators, potentially Somrist, um, got their FDA approval. They would compare their digital intervention to um, um, some kind of control condition that's usually controlled for time. Um, so you're spending it same amount of time on each of the conditions but you're getting different things. Uh, that's that's the right way to, to run the study. Um, and so our first step was, can we augment the therapist? Uh, and then the next step that uh, we're working on now is, can we replace them to some degree, even though I don't think they can ever fully be replaced? What do you think that the application, in, in order to get this out to the masses so that uh, and, and not through necessarily a direct consumer. I'm thinking about our sleep labs and our sleep physicians who are listening. You know, your what are your thoughts about you know how do how does a a, a product of you know an app like Sleep Space become a clinical practice of you know a sleep program? Yeah, I mean, I think you're touching on the biggest um, hurdle when rolling out this technology, um, and you know. The therapist knows this a lot of times. Um, the people that grade these NIH grants know this. Um, being adherent to this intervention is a huge problem. Um, and outcomes are so focused, are so reliant on adherence. You know, basically, the more modules you, that you complete in, you know, Sleepio and um, Somris, which are the two main digital competitors in this space, the more effective the out, the more effective you are on reducing the insomnia severity index, which is usually the primary outcome for these things. Um, so you want to increase adherence, and the problem is these interventions. It's almost like doing homework assignments. You know, it's work. No one wants to do it. Um, so that's why I think Internet of Things is exciting. Um, and I recently, I've been doing some contract work uh, for a company called Coco Home that has this radar device by the bed. Um, and uh, I saw some cool data that they produced um, where 
basically after 15 minutes, and I submitted this to the sleep conference in the last cycle, basically they have an algorithm where if you have insomnia and you spend more than 15 minutes in bed, um, they'll passively track that. You don't have to do anything. Um, there's no intervention that, you, you know, you're just passively there. The IOT nudges you, get out of bed. You know, that's one of the directives in cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia is like, get out of bed after 15, 20 minutes of not being able to fall asleep. Um, and we actually showed that the more this feature was engaged, the greater the reduction in the insomnia severity index. Um, so that was exciting, but, uh, you know, my thing also, um, that we were validating in our study, automatically changing lights in your environment, automatically adjusting sounds in your environment, um, waking you up gradually, you know, giving you notifications about your circadian rhythm, obviously having more interactive, like meditations based on biofeedback, all of those things, um, can make it more engaging and now the future of all this is having the AI do a lot of this stuff. So it's like with the large language models, it's like super personalized. Um, and that, that, that's really, I think, the future of a lot of this. How it works within the medical system is a challenge. Uh, so that's something I'm, try I'm trying to figure out. Do you think the personalization is really the key? Because you're right. When we talk about adherence to really anything, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, we've got the three of us have years of working in the CPAP space and adherence is, a, is monstrous. You know, is, is it personalizing it and then taking away a lot of the responsibility of the patient uh, so that it is automatic? What do you feel like is that trigger point that's going to drive that long-term success with technology like this? Yeah. yeah. When you, when you, uh, oh, my, my voice went weird. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so when you, you know, give someone the wrong information and it's some AI bot, or you say something that's not relevant to them anymore, you know, trust and automation is a really important thing. That's something that I've studied in, in uh, grad school. And, you know, when you lose that trust in the automated system, you can't really get it back. Um, and then people just throw it away like it's a useless toy. Um, so, you know, I think somehow representing to the person how the AI is thinking about you is probably really important. Um, also maybe exposing why it thinks this way about you. Um, you know, maybe it has wrong data and this happens all the time with wearables. I see it all the time. I'm sure you guys have talked about orthosomnia before on this show. Um, basically the data from wearables, making people more anxious about their sleep um, and then they sleep worse, but also how inaccurate it can be at things like deep sleep. You know, I've built some of the, I've published and built some of the algorithms. I think I have one of the most accurate ones on Apple Watch that's validated on thousands of nights of polysonography data. But, you know, it's pretty good at the sleep stage. It's good at the sleep wake. Um, it's pretty good at the stages, but it can easily be very wrong, especially for abnormal people, not, you know, not the normal sleeper. Um, and then when you're giving people wrong information, it can cause problems. Um, so I think you want to expose to the person why the AI is thinking this way, building that trust while also being able to, um, you know, really personalize it. And the minute that you get something wrong, you lose them. So you basically can't get anything wrong, at least for a significant period of time. Um, so that's the hard part. You would think it has to match their intuition, you know, because if they intuitively think they slept good and didn't, you know, there's got to be some sort of, of feedback that that would support even their 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 incorrect assumption. You know, how does how does it play with that? So I can see it. Where do you where do you see this going? I mean, when you kind of look into the future and and 
if we're thinking of Moore's law, it's going to be quick. <laughs> you know, a year from now, two years from now, what what does this this sort of thing look like? And if you could just if you could just add to that question as well, is you talked a little bit about IoT. If you you know, where is this going to go? If you add that AI piece with the IoT together and with Moore's law, where are we going to be in six months to a year? Yeah, it's moving quick. That's why I'm I'm trying to be able to not have this tech get ahead of me here and be in, on the forefront of it. And I just want to challenge a little bit what you said too. I agree that it has to match the person's intuition, but the hard part about this is sometimes the most meaningful insights are when their intuition is wrong, right? So you know, it's almost like a fish in a. I like to say the um, the analogy. A fish in a fishbowl doesn't know it's in water. So there's some saying like that. Um, Cause all it knows is water. And you know, with That's something good. like apnea, you know, you don't realize there's, there's a life where you have more energy throughout the day. Sometimes, you know, it takes to being on the CPAP to be like, oh, this is how I'm supposed to be. Um, so you want to match the intuitions, but also push people you know, and that's what a human can do. A human can be like, actually, you're wrong. I'm the expert. You should trust me on this. Look at the data. You you wake up 20 times an hour, you know? Um, so the AI w w would have to match the, the um, perceptions, but also push people in the direction when the person's perceptions are wrong. It's almost like corrected empathy. They can empathize, but redirect. Exactly. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, Are you a sleep tech looking for new opportunities? Well, MedBridge Healthcare is one of the largest employers of sleep technologists, and they are growing. If you are a sleep technologist interested in a new position, potential paid relocation, or looking for a career advancement, consider a career with MedBridge Healthcare. Now back to the show. You mentioned the Apple Watch, and, and we know that some of the home sleep apnea testing equipment has started to mirror a little closer to more of a you know, the, the consumer-based sleep tracking devices. Um, from an integration standpoint, have you thought about integrating with some of those ring technologies or, you know, something that has PPG that, you know, technically would qualify as a diagnostic so the data is a little sharper than the Apple Watch? Yeah. And, you know, there's this whole controversy right now with the PPG, a lot of these consumer PPG devices being a little bit racist. Um, they're not good for darker hued skin. Yep. Honestly, I think that's partly why Apple never went after this. Um, it might be a big reason why. I mean, their sensor is good. I mean, they could probably predict this stuff pretty well. But yeah, um, you know, I like, I work with Wesper, um, which is one of these diagnostic companies um, that can evaluate if you have sleep. And I actually discovered, I was just testing their device and discovered for myself that I had a mild case of sleep apnea because I'm like 20 pounds overweight or so. Um, and so I, I use that device to identify that. Um, I actually ended up getting an MAD a mandibular advancement device uh, for my issue because it wasn't that severe. Um, I want to integrate with them. I also like the BioStrap. That's another one of these sensors. Um, he has a pretty sophisticated algorithm. He's been working on it for a long time. That one's not FDA approved yet. Um, you know, you really need, you know, uh, the Wesper has two stickers that's essentially like an EKG and you're wearing a pulse ox. Um, I think you need, you know, you need that sort of montage similar to like watch pet. Um, so yeah, I, I like all those devices. Um, I, I, the Wesper, they do have an API now. I, it's, if I had more um, ammunition, I would probably integrate with it. Another question I was going to ask you from a patient engagement standpoint, I guess this is sort of a, a two part question. The first would be, you know, how do you tailor the information so that it's not just blanket information, assuming all patients are at the same academic level, same, um, you know, socioeconomic 
uh, you know, place in life uh, to be able to really hone in the, the, the therapy for that particular patient? That would be sort of the first part of the question. Um, and, and then the, the second part, how do you keep the, the engagement also from not becoming intrusive? Um, I know that mm -hmm. a lot of times I will delete an app if it starts asking me too many questions. Oh, yeah. No, yeah, there, there's a fine line there. And I mean, I think theoretically, the AI could navigate that. You know, we, we, we've all been talking about large language models, you know, the chat GPT thing. There's also a subsection of this, uh, I don't know, as and many people know, large medical models. Um, so I think theoretically, these this technology would take in large amounts of data that already exist. I mean, it already exists for most people in Apple Health. Um, you know, if if you're at all interested in your health, you've probably saved. I think it automatically tracks steps no matter what. Um, but e even so, I would say, um, and you're going to give me, you're going to ask this question is going to reveal some of my uh, secret sauce a little bit. But I'm um, answering this. So I would say um, you can pull a lot of data that already exists because Internet of Things are so ubiquitous at this point. You know, we're almost hitting an inflection point. People aren't that, um, they don't have much allegiance to these devices too, but the bigger companies have found out a way to aggregate them. That's why it's so competitive for startups to, you know, Eventually, you run up against Google and Apple and Samsung. Um, but I think there probably is a way to leverage those systems in order to um, identify that user who maybe is, um, who, who wants that, who can, how we can give that user that personalized inter information and maybe also even identify their level of interest in um, getting that annoying push notification for the fifth time. If it's really pertinent to you, you're not gonna delete the app. Um, so yeah, it's a hard, it's definitely a hard problem. Like I wish I had 10 engineers, I'd, I'd solve it. I'd be able to solve it, but uh, yeah. Doc, we're uh, getting on for time. So before we go, could you tell us a little bit about Sleep Space? You just barely touched on that at the beginning. So could you tell us a little bit more about Sleep Space? Sure. So it's one of the most sophisticated apps on the App Store for measuring sleep. Um, it can measure sleep with the Apple Watch. It integrates with all the wearables. And it also has, has ways of tracking sleep with the sensors of any phone. Um, so you can either place it on your bed or you can place it on your nightstand, or we have a little mechanism called the Sleep Space Smart Bed. It's a phone charger that slides under your bed. And it allows us to play sounds very precisely on one side of the bed. Um, so what excited me about this, as I mentioned in the beginning, is um, improving your sleep 1%. And, I stumbled on the deep sleep stimulation effect in the literature, and that's what my TED Talk is about. And it's basically the idea that you could place sounds um, that emulate your delta brain waves in order to entrain that brain state. And uh, we published a paper showing that we could do it with just sounds alone. So we built this really, you know, it's one thing to track sleep, it's another thing to enhan enhance it in real time. So we're, one of the only apps, maybe the only app that I'm aware of, where we adjust sound based on your sleep state. So we'll sample your motion data every 30 seconds, or we'll sample it at 50 hertz, which is a crazy, um, very uh, 50 times a second. And then we'll measure your sleep stage every 30 seconds and adjust sound to either block out noise pollution more dynamically um, or play this deep sleep stimulation thing, or awaken you in a lighter stage of sleep, or to help you wind down. We call it a sleep journey, where it's like wind down, sounds the, um, play like a pink noise machine, and then a smart alarm clock in the morning, um, collects all the data across the wearables. It has a consensus sleep diary that the clinicians love to use. That's kind of how you treat insomnia. 
and then um, a bunch of sleep programs for personalized experiences for the biohacker, for the snorer. We can measure snoring in our system. So that's sleep space in a nutshell. Thank you, Doc. Uh, sincerely <laughs> appreciate that. And um, hey, before we go, is there any anything else that you want to touch touch upon? Where can people find you and get more information about you and Sleep Space? Sure. I mean, sleepspace.com, check it out. Um, we, we also have a team of coaches that um, power our app and you can have a, co a coaching session with one of them. They're experts in everything from, you know, sleep problems with when you're dealing with menopause to snoring um, to, you know, weight loss and, and apnea to dreaming and, you know, um, nothing medical. Just as this is all coaching feedback. Um, you know, biohacking, of course. So you can check it all out at sleepspace.com. Well, thank you so much, Doc. We sincerely appreciate you joining us and congrats to you on your newborn. Uh, God bless. Yeah, we, just got, just got yeah, out of the hospital. <laughs> yeah, man. So congrats on that. And thank you so much once again for joining us. And right. our folks out there, thank you for joining us as well. Thanks to our sponsors. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and most importantly, share with all your friends, all the sleep techs out there. And until next time, we say, lights on. All right. We say this all the time. What a show, but really, what a show. Uh, time for some post -cals. What do you guys think? You know, that conversation could have gone a, a million different directions. Amen. What a brilliant mind. I mean, every time he started talking, I thought we could go and talk about everything from his research and his NIH to military, but just what he's doing with AI is just really refreshing. It, a different view, a different way of thinking about, you know, how we can tackle a really tough problem with insomnia. And so a really refreshing spin and take on what AI can do in sleep medicine. I really like the fact that, like you said, what AI can do in sleep medicine. Well, we got a bit of feedback. All right. Well, what you said about what AI can do in sleep medicine, especially with CBTI, it's very interesting to hear that the little nudges and uh, Dr. Thaler, I believe his name is, who had the book Nudge uh, that talks about that. Those little nudges that get you to go to the next level, and that's what this, uh, what he's been talking about, how the AI is going to help us do that. You're not expecting a therapist to sit there right next to you uh, night after night, but this is going to. I, I see this as what it would be doing for you. Hey, by the way, I I, I completely forgot because I I was engaged in the conversation i forgot to ask him how i get onto a ted talk so uh <laughs> i'm gonna have you were to this I'm, close. I'm gonna, yeah close. i know i'm gonna have to circle back with it to see how how i get uh how i get on onto a ted talk um okay. no it, it's great about? stuff and and daniel and i have have communicated over the years just sort of connecting uh, and him keeping me up to date on on what he's been doing with sleep space we, we didn't even get into the military um, research that he's done in the past. Um, but, you know, it, it's interesting. How many people do we talk to who have their own sleep issue? Right. Um, you know, he, no, no HIPAA violations here. He, he actually told us that he has his own, you know, um, issues with sleep and that, you know, he's dealing with it himself. So, you know, my goodness, to be super passionate, to be, you know, um, engaged in a in in the way that he is and then you're also dealing with your own challenges yourself and i i'm i'm absolutely a person who can say that yes i sleep with cpap and yes i also deal with insomnia on occasion so you know even even those of us who are in this field don't necessarily always have it all figured out i thought it was super cool that he started this unlike we often hear it oh i I was, I had sleep apnea. I was prescribed CPAP. He started with, I had delayed sleep phase syndrome. I thought yeah. that was really cool. Yeah. Well, that's the nerd in me talking. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's good. It's, uh, it's nice to hear even just a different disorder than what we normally hear. Right. And it's kind of weird to say that, but you're a different disorder, but right. Yeah. That's actually the one topic I want us to, uh, to sort of be in search of trying to find, you know, an expert to come in and, and talk about delayed sleep phase syndrome, because I, I actually picked up on recently, there's a, there's a Facebook group with thousands of people who are dealing with delayed sleep, some form of delayed sleep phase syndrome. And 
we don't talk about it enough. Um, you know, I think as a as a society, uh, you know, we everything seems to be so focused on sleep apnea, sort of primarily, and then probably insomnia second. Um, you know, but this challenge of you know incremental sleep in different uh, in small periods and I can't imagine the world that they live in and then how you overcome that and, and try to, to gain some sense of, you know, a normal life. That's that's a great point that you made. I, I recall back in clinic how we used to see a lot of those. And I was really surprised because that was different from being a night tech. You you know, we mainly dealt with uh, with sleep apnea and at the daytime. In clinic itself, you would see these delayed sleep phase and trying to get them re-entrained into, into getting the right uh, right phase of sleep. It was just absolutely wild for me. I do wish that there would be a, a, a day and time when there would be as many resources sort of put into uh, the treatment of insomnia. You know, this is multiple guests now that have talked about the fact that there are so few providers um, in that space. And you know, trying to, to bring along technologies to sort of aid, you know, in CBTI and, and coaching these patients that, and, and not stepping over so that it's it's not a clinical engagement, um, you know, that would require a physician, but um, because there is the lack of available care for these patients, and, and especially the number of patients, um, you know, it seems like the there is an opportunity that's sort of being left out right now. In that space. Well, I think it's part of it. And, you know, when Lanesta trials were first happening, the lab I was in, you know, we were in, the, in part of the one of the phases of that trial and finding the right kind of patient that met true insomnia was so difficult because mm -hmm. it's so many other disorders or some other disorder that that complicated the research. And I think that's another part of it is it's 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 the insomnia, but it's also all the other things that someone could be struggling with. I mean, our somnology book from the Academy has nearly a hundred disorders in it for a reason. And uh, sometimes some people seem to have all of them at once, but <laughs> um, you know, but it, but you're right. That's one that it would be great to have somebody on to really take a deep dive with them. Well, sleep apnea pays the bills. So, you know, that, that's, there you that, go. that seems Money to be talks. The, why the focus <laughs> is, is on sleep apnea, yep. but but we've got to figure out a way to to monetize the other you know sleep issues and 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 bring it into clinical care. That's why I asked him the question about sleep labs and and sleep physicians. You know, just trying to see where you know there might be an opportunity for his his product and you know his app and their their practice at some point. Well, with that, I think it's time for us to close. Now, that was a great discussion at the end, and um, like you said, let's see what the future holds, not just for. Uh, Dr. Daniel, but what else happens in sleep technology? You're welcome, Jerry. Oh, appreciate you, man. Always. <laughs> He's a giver. He's a... <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, folks out there until next time we say cheers. See ya. Are you a sleep tech looking for new opportunities? Well, Medbridge Healthcare is one of the largest employers of sleep technologists and they are growing. If you are a sleep technologist interested in a new position, potential paid relocation, or looking for a career advancement, consider a career with MedBridge Healthcare. Now back to the show.